Welcome to Numerical Methods. So, and um, today is uh, yeah maybe one also of my favorite topics. Yeah, we will start discussing the Monte Carlo method, and uh, yeah, we we will uh, be on say some interesting uh, journey. Yeah, so we will start by doing something completely inefficient and maybe stupid. Yeah, so that's how I uh, will introduce the Monte Carlo method. You believe it is completely inefficient. Uh, it is very easy to implement, yeah, but uh, that's because it's maybe such a plain, simple, stupid method. And then we will derive convergence results, yeah, but that hold only in probability. So these seem to be completely useless. And uh, in the end of this journey, all these issues can be fixed. And you will see that actually this probabilistic nature is not a bug. It's rather a feature of the method that enables a very special yeah, and very important property. So as I mentioned, the Monte Carlo method is very versatile. Yeah? You can use it in many different applications. Yeah, Our application derivative valuation is just one possible, possible application. And it is very easy to implement, very simple. Also this easy to implement, yeah, is already um, a, a feature because it also means that this method has a property that it allows us to very easily parallelize it, yeah, distribute the calculations among different machines in the cloud, to the GPU, yeah, to different uh, GPU threads and so on. The important feature, and that's maybe the reason why the method is so important, is that it copes well with problems in high dimensions. So it breaks the curse of dimensionality. And we will have a nice example, nice comparison when we will talk about Monte Carlo integration. So using it as an integration method. Uh, before we do Monte Carlo integration, we will of course discuss convergence result. And there is an issue which yeah, at first looks a little bit as if the method is completely useless because we will use the method in a pointwise manner and all these theoretical results only hold in probability. So it may be that our point is on a null set and we have actually no result. But the interesting thing is that this issue can be fixed. Yeah? And we will also discuss this later. So these are the quasi Monte Carlo method. And you can, uh, you actually see that this probabilistic nature is yeah not a bug. It's, uh, it's a feature. It's actually the feature enabling this um, breaking of the curse of dimensionality. Yeah, let's start with an introduction. So um, in mathematical finance, yeah, we are uh, confronted with the task to calculate an expectation. We can express the derivative value as an expectation of a random variable. And that is what we like to do now. I would like to discuss a numerical approximation of the expectation of a random variable. And as an introduction, uh, let us consider the case of a discrete random variable Z. So I'm in a discrete setup. So it means that I only have finitely many uh, elementary events, omega one to omega capital N. And then you can express the expectation of this random variable Z. Okay, just evaluate Z on every such uh, event. Yeah, so now we have here the omega i and multiply with the probability that this uh, event uh, occurs. Okay, so this is my um, expression for the expectation. And now let me uh, consider maybe a very stupid way of approximating this uh, probability. Yeah? And then I will later plug this in into this uh, formula. So assume that you have a sequence of 
independent random drawings of my events. Yeah, so from my set of events, now I have a sequence of drawings. So these are here my XK. And um, this sequence is done according to the probability. Yeah, so this means XK equals omega i occurs at probability p of omega i. Yeah, so my, my sequence is a sampling according to the probability. Okay, what does this mean? So this means if you just fix, say, one omega i. So uh, let, me, let me fix an omega i here. This is maybe now a fixed one. Okay, and you then count how often do you observe in the sequence this fixed omega i, you just count it, and you then divide by the number of uh, elements you have observed, then this ratio converges to the probability. So we converge to probability of this um, omega i. So this partial sum SM for um, say a fixed omega i is something that should converge yeah, to this uh, probability. So this is a fairly simple method for approximating the probability. Think of, for example, a dice yeah, where every uh, side yeah, has the probability one over six. Okay, so you have the events uh, yeah, one to six, yeah, and then you generate this sequence XK, yeah, and you just say, okay, how often do I observe the number, say three? Yeah, uh, you count it, and then the number of elements uh, you have observed so far uh, is the denominator, and that converges to one over six. Okay, so that's so trivial, but uh, maybe uh, let me just uh, look how this would look in the computer. Let me implement this. So um, I don't do this live coding now because maybe it's too trivial for this, but we can just peek into an implementation. Yeah, so I have here a small program running average of indicator function, maybe of indicator. Uh, so here on the top, yeah, there is just um, that I call a function that for a fixed omega i and uh, a number of elements that we should observe, yeah, returns this uh, sequence yeah, uh, of uh, ratios, um, number of elements omega, we have observed divided by number of elements we have observed so far. So let me have a look at this small subroutine. So what I do, there is a random number generator that generates now uniform distributed uh, random numbers. We will discuss this later. I yeah? just use it as a black box. Then I will generate a list, a list of these uh, numbers, yeah, of these ratios. Okay. Um, I initialize my sum to zero. This is the number of yeah, uh, omega i's I have observed. Yeah, The omega is an argument here. Yeah? So then I loop over all those number of uh, samples, which I should observe. I generate now the random number between one included and six included. Yeah, So this here generates between zero and five. Uh, you can look up the documentation if you just hover over it. Yeah, zero included here, and the specified value is exclusive. Exclusive, so this is zero and five. So I shift it by one. It's between one and six. I define my indicator function. Yeah, is this drawing from my sequence? Yeah, is my xk equal to the omega i? Yeah, if this is the case, my indicator is one. Otherwise, it's zero. I sum up my indicator, and then I calculate the current approximation of my probability, the current um, average. So this is the number of summations I have performed divided by the number of elements I have observed so far. Okay, since I start here in zero, this is an i plus one. And then I add this to this list. 
Yeah, you can now uh, run this program. It will print, yeah, what, what it will print, the number of observed elements, the current drawing, the indicator, the sum, and the average. Yeah, maybe I run this just. Okay, and you see that, uh, yeah, now I've chosen here the number three. Yeah, you see that we have exactly this algorithm. So uh, at the second point, Sample or we already have a three. My indicator jumps to one. The sum is now one. Okay, it's one divided by two. It's 0 0.5. Then here, for example, in 10, yeah, I observe another three. My indicator is one. The jump, the sum jumps from one to two. Uh, so it's two divided by 10. It's 0 0.2. So and now this here, this average. Uh, converges to one over six, which is 0.166666, yeah, period. Uh, and I can do this for different sequences, yeah? So this here is one possible sequence, and this argument here, the seed, will just do the same for a different sequence. We will discuss all this random number generations in a separate topic, yeah? So you can do this for another sequence here, yeah, where we get different results, and I also have a plot, and here you see the plot of this um, running average. Yeah, so first I jump here to 0 0.5 and then I slowly decay. I decay like a one over n yeah, because I do not count any observation, yeah? uh, but I increase the denominator. Yeah, so I, and then there, it, it is another jump yeah, because I count another observation, but the size of this jump is just the one over n yeah, for the given n, yeah, because I'm always now dividing by the n. So you see that I always decline a little bit and the jump sizes are um, becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, you can also observe this if yeah, you continue now with more numbers and you see that I have indeed some kind of convergence yeah, to the um, one over six. So the one over six is the 0 0.1666. Yeah. Um, I have here the two lines yeah, generated for the two different sequences, independent sequences. Uh, actually the green one was a little bit deviating. Yeah. The thing is that this is just now one sample. We will come back to this yeah, because all this is later important. Yeah. So one sequence is just maybe one sample path here and the path is getting closer to the true solution but if you now say for example look at for example here at 1000 elements and you cut there then you see that some sequences are already closer some sequences are yeah, a little bit further apart yeah. uh, so there is some uncertainty in how good your approximation is depending on yeah, which sequence you, you have picked. But regardless of which peak sequence you have picked, yeah, uh, we will yeah, reduce the error in a certain sense. Okay, so let's go back. I also have the picture here now yeah, in the slides. So that's what we do. We have here depicted this running sum Okay, that approximates the probability for that fixed um, omega j. So now I would like to use this way of yeah, very brutally, yeah, no, stu stupid, stupid way uh, of approximating the probability. I would like to use this here, so the number two, in my formula for the expectation operator. So we now use our approximation of the probability of this fixed omega i in the expression that occurred in the expectation. So random variable z evaluated on omega i 
multiplied with the probability evaluated on omega i. Okay, so read the following maybe from right to left, yeah, so for didactical reasons, that's a bit nicer. Yeah? So I have that I like to approximate z times p. And now I use my little approximation. I take this running sum, yeah? So I take the sequence xk. My sequence xk is checked. Is it equal to my omega i? If yes, then I count up yeah? and then I divide by the number of elements, number of drawings observed. Yeah. So this is here our number two yeah, from our experiment. So I just plug this in and I see that I can approximate z of omega i times the probability with z of omega i times this running running sum. Okay, now you can just move the z into the sum. Yeah? You just move here the z in the sum. Yeah? So you get this expression. Yeah, and now observe there is the indicator function. So I have that we multiplied z of omega i times indicator xk is equal to omega i. So this is zero if the xk is not equal to omega i. And it is actually z of xk if the xk is equal to omega i. So I can just, in this sum here, I just can just replace the omega i with the xk. Okay, so we have now on the left-hand side, z of xk multiplied with the indicator is xk equals to omega i. Okay, so you count just the values of z of omega i, yeah, again and again, instead of counting a one, you just count these values, and then you divide by your number of total observations, the length of the sequence, the capital M. So, uh, but I don't like to consider just here this expression z times p, I would like to consider the expectation, yeah, so the expectation was that I take the sum over all omegas, yeah? So this is now i from one to, it was a capital N, I believe, right? From capital to capital N. So I take the sum over all omegas to get on the right-hand side the expectation. And on the left-hand side, you just observe that, okay, summing the indicator function here over all omega i's, yeah, there's always one xk is equal to an omega i, so that's the identity, that's just the one, yeah. So you get a one here on the left-hand side, yeah, so there's a one times one here if you like. So you get that this indicator here is just being removed by applying this sum. So I get for the left-hand side this expression. And this is the Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation. Yeah? So you see, this here is just take a sequence that is sampled according to the probability. So you saw that I marked the probability in blue, yeah? but I also marked this sequence here in blue. This sequence now contains the information of this probability measure because the sequence is sampled according to the probability and then evaluate the random variable z on that sequence and take the average yeah so take the sum over all these values divided by the number of samples so this is now the approximation of my expectation so um you see there are actually two quantities here. There is the N, 
which is the number of omegas of events which I have. And there's the M, the number of samples that we do. And if you look here into our little simulation, I did 2000 samplings and I got a little bit closer. Yeah, The conversions rate seems to be very slow in the end. Yeah, um, Okay. And my application here was just uh, six different omegas. So this here was a six. And this here is maybe a 2000. Though that's really a very stupid way of approximating the expectation. Yeah. So this here is far more efficient six summations than that one. Yeah. And this here is the exact solution. Okay. So we have the Monte Carlo approximation. Um, the XK is generated according to the probability. Yeah, what does this mean? So if you have, say, a set of omegas, yeah, where some omegas have a low probability and some omegas have a very high probability, then what will happen is that in your sequence, these points with the high probability occur just more often. Yeah? So you will just evaluate set again and again on such an a more important point, yeah? so a point with um, a higher um, probability. So you could say that important values, Z of XK, yeah, uh, occur more often in the sum. So that sounds yeah, quite good because important things, yeah, maybe they should occur uh, quite often. In the discrete setup, it also sounds very inefficient, yeah, because if you already know the probability of these guys, why should we add them up again and again? Yeah? So this may look very stupid. This may look very inefficient at first. But now the left-hand side, yeah? so the left-hand side, my Monte Carlo approximation or my Monte Carlo sampling, approximating the expectation, this guy has some advantages. Yeah, what happens if the number of calculations that is required to achieve a specific level of approximation is much smaller than n? So consider the case where your space of omegas is huge. Yeah? I mean, it could be infinite. Yeah? It's huge. And there are a lot of unimportant things that have zero yeah, or almost vanishing probability. Yeah? You will add very many small values. You will add very often a zero. On the other hand, here, I'm just picking... The really the important points and I'm evaluating Z on the important points. Yeah. So this here is stupid if, for example, M is large, but if it is the other way around, maybe the method is smart. Okay, because we are dropping the things that do not contribute a lot to the sum. And there is another also, yeah, maybe subtle advantage of doing this. Um, this formula somehow decouples the modeling of the probability. Uh, so the P, which I sometimes marked in blue, yeah. So the generation of the drawings XK models the probability. And this can be done maybe independent. Yeah? We can consider numerical method to generate sequences of certain distributions. And from that, we have separated the evaluation of the random variable. Yeah? So this can be done independently from the evaluation of the random variable. So for example, in our application, this corresponds to that we have a model. Yeah? The model, for example, for the stock, for the asset, you know, for the random object. And we have a financial derivative, a financial product 
that we evaluate on this distribution. Uh, we can separate this a little bit. So this is also an advantage from an implementation design. So later we will discuss random number generations, yeah, which then focuses on actually just creating here this, this XK. Okay, so um, yeah, the example here relied that we could interchange our uh, summation yeah, and we can also, of course, reformulate this for continuous um, random variables. Yeah. And um, in this uh, chapter, we will have a look at random variables that have values in R yeah, and later also in RD. And later we will also have, say, random variables that yeah, have functions as, as values, so complete sample paths. But actually, um, the interesting point is since we do numerical methods um, and we will do the time discretization of stochastic differential uh, equations before we apply the Monte Carlo method. So we first do the time discretization and then we will apply the Monte Carlo method. Actually, this is not completely true. We will always be in the setup that we have random variables in, in, in an RD yeah? because we always discretize. This is also something nice about the lecture here. If you implement things in a computer, there is a certain point where you start discretizing and mathematics in a discrete setup is often much easier. Yeah? It's linear algebra yeah? and, and stuff like that. Um, of course, uh, the subtle important thing is uh, where should be the point where you discretize? Yeah? So should you first do that step or that step? Okay. <clears throat> So that was my little introduction into the Monte Carlo method. And now comes a small yeah, remark yeah, or a small recapitulation that maybe at first also really looks very trivial, but um, it is very important for the understanding you know, and it will later show us why the method is so powerful. And the first part is, what is actually a drawing of a random variable? How is this modeled? Yeah? So I also need this uh, when we will discuss the conversions result. And maybe you remember this from school. So we have a single random variable given. Yeah? So given a random variable, x. And then we will consider drawings of this random variable. Well, what is a drawing? What is an independent drawing of x? So by this, I mean, I have an x of omega i. But how do we now model that this is an independent drawing? You know? How do you know? What, what is now the independent drawing? So this is done by considering a sequence of iid random variables xi having the same distribution as x. So now you have a sequence of random variables. And what you now do is that on this sequence of random variables, you choose a single event, a single event omega tilde. And the space on which this sequence, you know, this sequence is now defined on a product space, the space on which this sequence is now defined, you know, so this is a different space, now generates this property that we can interpret it as independent drawings of this, this random variable. Okay, so here you had a sequence of omega i's. And on the other interpretation, you have a sequence of random variables on a fixed event. Yeah? Left, uh, a fixed random variable evaluated on a sequence of event can be interpreted as a sequence of random variables on a single event. 
So to make this precise, yeah, maybe you still know this. Uh, it's a recapitulation. What we do is we have our random variable given. So I have my X given on this probability space here. And what I do is I will define the product space. Yeah? So I have the product space, the Cartesian product of the omega. On that, I also define the corresponding filtration. And then I define the measure and the measure is then defined in this way that we actually have independence. Yeah? So it's the product of the individual uh, probabilities. Yeah, and now on this product space, I define my sequence. Yeah? So the sequence can be interpreted as a vector. Yeah? So it is on defined on this product space. So the product space has a tilde here. So I define now my X tilde as X tilde one to X tilde N. And how is this random variable now defined? Yeah, for um, a single event, omega tilde, taken from my product space. So omega tilde taken here from my product space. I have that X tilde I of this omega tilde is my X of omega I. Okay, where each individual omega I is yeah, from omega. So the vector of the omegas is from the omega tilde. Yeah, so instead of, yeah, I already mentioned this, instead of having n different realizations, x yeah, on say a sequence omega i uh, of one random variable x, I now have a single event omega tilde, and I use that to evaluate a sequence X tilde I. Okay, so this is in the following sense important because later when we discuss convergence result, I will take this interpretation. Yeah, So I will not discuss the X of omega I, we will discuss a sequence of X tilde of a fixed omega. Yeah, the two are identically, yeah, identical by this mapping here, by this interpretation, but we will discuss the X tilde I. And then what will happen is that we will consider convergence results for the sequence of IID random variables that hold in probability. And now you see the problem. Because if we have this sequence of samplings, that corresponds to a single event. Yeah, that corresponds to a single event in the product space. But if you have now a convergence result that only holds for the sequence of random variables in probability, it doesn't tell you anything about the single event. And that's an issue. So we will, yeah, for a moment, just forget about this. And I promise you that later you will understand that the probabilistic nature of the method is really a nice property. And there will be a surprising other lemma, other theorem that will actually fix this. And we will get also a pointwise convergence result. Okay, so that was just a reminder. What is actually behind this? Yeah, if you say I have here samplings of a random variable, yeah, so this is the model that is actually here behind this. There's another thing, and then we come to the next point. Observe that actually this here is a n-dimensional space we are creating. Yeah, we are creating a Cartesian product. Yeah? So this is an n-dimensional space. This is a high-dimensional space. So a sequence of n elements 
in a row corresponds just to a sampling from a very high dimension space. This brings me to the next topic, vectors of IID random variables with IID components. So assume you have a sequence of IID random variables, the random variables map to R, no? so just a single scalar value for each of these random variables. But now I would like to construct um, a vector value term, random variable that maps to RD, where every component of these random variable is of the same distribution. Yeah, there is a very simple algorithm that tells me how I can do this. So I have a sequence given here of IID random variable, x1, x2, x3, xd, xd plus one, and so on. Yeah, let it continue to run. And from that sequence, I can now generate a new sequence of IID vector valued random variables in D dimension. So I have a given D here. By just taking the first D elements and say, okay, this here is now an element of the new sequence. Okay, this means I built vectors YK where YK has elements YK1, YK2, and so on, up to YKD. And for these elements, YKJ, I just take the XK minus one times D plus J. Yeah? So I start with K equals one. So it's zero times D plus J. It's one, two, three, up to D. And then the K uh, counts up. So that is here in green, that is your sequence xi. And from that sequence, you generate now the vectors for the yk. So I have now the vector yk here. And you just populate the elements of this vector by saying, okay, this guy goes here, this guy goes there and so on. So that's now my sequence yk. You see, if this is d equals two, I need, say, six elements from the sequence x to generate three elements um, for the sequence y. Yeah, so you have this nice uh, algorithm of generating here such a random sequence, yeah? This one goes there, this one goes there, this one goes there, and so on. Okay, maybe maybe I just show you that this really works, yeah? We have also a small code that shows how this works. So there is here a random vector plot. Uh, we will discuss again random number generators later, yeah? So just take it as a black box. I want 1,000 sample points. I have my random number generator here, yeah? and then I loop over my 1,000 sample points, and I take the first random number and I populate it to the X, and I take the second random number and I populate it to the Y. So two random numbers from the one-dimensional sequence define one element from the two-dimensional sequence. I store this here in this list and this uh, small command plots this now as an X, Y uh, scatter plot. So this looks like that. Okay, you generate two-dimensional random samples from a one-dimensional sequence. And this is well, maybe a trivial algorithm, but this is the next big thing here. And we will also come back to this um, yeah, aspect because look at the complexity. If you like to generate a sequence in D dimension, you need D sample points from the one dimensional sequence to generate one sample points in the d-dimensional 
sequence. So I need these sample points from the one dimensional sequence to generate one sample point in the D dimensional sequence. So this means that the complexity or the time needed to generate the sequence, this scales linear in the dimension. Okay. So it's not to, uh, to the power of D like we will see in other methods. Yeah? It just scales linear. And also if you go now back to our discussion, how a drawing is interpreted, you see that a drawing, so a sequence is just an element in a D dimensional space. Yeah. So whether you now have three two dimensional objects uh, in a row, or you have two three dimensional objects in a row, or you have six one dimensional objects in a row, for him, yeah, it's actually not a difference. Yeah? So that's here at the core that creating samples in higher dimension scales linear in the dimension. Okay, so this guy here is uh, important and uh, we will get a deeper understanding uh, for this later. So now, yeah, let me just give the definition of our Monte Carlo yeah, approximation. So I have a sequence of IID random variables, x1, x2, x3. So these are IID real valued random variables on the same probability space. There is the expectation mu. So they are all IID. So the expectation is always the same. Yeah. So the expectation of say X1. And I call now one divided by N, take the sum of XI. I call that the Monte Carlo, oops. Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation mu. So we have a motivation why this is approximating uh, maybe the expectation, but maybe we need to, to prove it. Um, and then if you just plug in an omega, I call one divided by n sum xi of a single omega. So this is now a fixed event omega here. I call that the Monte Carlo sampling or Monte Carlo simulation. Sometimes I also just use Monte Carlo approximation uh, of the expectation mu. Uh, so this here is um, a random variable. Yeah? A sum of random variables is a random variable. This is a random variable that will converge in a certain sense to the expectation. And this here is, a, is, is the evaluation of that random variable. And yeah, there is uh, actually not yet a justification uh, why we are actually allowed to do this, why this is um, a meaningful value. And the justification will maybe come a bit, a bit, a bit later. Uh, so there are different definitions. Yeah, so sometimes they use Monte Carlo approximation just for the random variable, sometimes for the evaluation of the random variable. This is again the remark, which I already mentioned. So I have here my random variable. And um, what I will do now in the next section is that we will discuss convergence. And these convergence results are in probability because we consider this object in a probability space. And then we have the evaluation of this random variable for a fixed omega. And it appears to be a bit useless you know, because our 
convergence result is in probability. So it's not clear if it tells us anything. Actually, it doesn't tell us anything uh, about this value if you just take a fixed omega. Yeah? So just remember also the picture with the red part and the green 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 path. Yeah. So it could be that we take here some sequence, yeah, and this sequence is totally off. So why this is true, this will be fixed later. Yeah? So this will be fixed. And we will also see that the probabilistic nature is not a bug, it's rather um, a feature. So it will be fixed by, for example, the quasi Monte Carlo methods. Yeah, so that was um, maybe a first introduction to the Monte Carlo method. And in the end, uh, for me, the important result that generating vectors yeah, of random variables in higher dimensions scales linear in the dimension. So now my next section will be um, that we discuss the convergence result. So in which sense does this object here converge to the expectation and do we have a convergence rate? <laughs>